the proper times <coughs> where they are making the right kinds of progress. And by proper times, I mean over a longer stretch of time, rather than maybe, for example, over a half term. And I think we're closer to assessment being used to vehicle to identify what kids do and don't know, but crucially, building something into that process where we can actually do something about it in enough time. And, and finally, I suppose, moving, moving away from the relentless focus on year 11 to maybe how we can use assessment at key stage 3 to drive the kinds of interventions <coughs> that we need to close the gap when it's small enough to be able to do something about it. Whereas I find, particularly, you know, the cohort 260 year 11, that the chasm is so vast between the high uh, ability and the low ability. And despite the things that you try and build at year 11, it's ultimately just a mere patch. It doesn't really, doesn't really do what we want it to do. Um, so I've tried to draw upon the idea of threshold concept as underpinning our um, assessment model. And actually, I, I started working about on this a, a few years ago when I we was still head of English. I just teaching each other, I don't have any responsibility in the department. Um, and it was before that the um, SATs were, were abolished in terms of the levels. So I was thinking about some of this stuff at a time when I thought that might happen, but it hadn't actually been officially announced. And I've kind of gone back relentlessly to drawing you to, to where I'm at now. Um, Ray Landis spoke brilliantly um, this morning. I, mean, I was just blown away by the quality of his presentation. So I, I don't think I really need to spend any time really unpicking threshold concepts, other than to remind you of the sort of four or five central tenets that they're transformative, integrative, bounded and, tr and troubled. Troublesome things are particularly interesting one. And I, I drove down with a colleague um, this morning, that to our budget. And one of the things that we were talking about was troublesome knowledge in relation to teachers' own understanding, their own pedagogy, their own subject knowledge. And how it's, it's really hard, particularly with adults, but obviously with students too, when to coax them through that, that area where, of uncertainty, where you come out the other end <coughs> knowing something profoundly different. Um, I've got a slightly different take on threshold concepts, um, and I don't know whether I've just misinterpreted it or not. And I want to give a ex practical example to illustrate the way that I'm looking at threshold concepts. And once we've looked at that, then I'll um, talk about how I've applied that to our assessment model in English, which is now being an assessment model we're going to use across the school as a whole. Okay, so I want to start um, by exploring the notion of what is a simile. And I'm going to do that through the example of uh, Milton's Paradise Lost. So hopefully that's of interest to English teachers. Um, here's a simile uh, from Paradise Lost from Book One. Does anyone know what the missing word is? I just thought that might be nice, it's moon. Okay. Um, so I've, in, in bold the, uh, is the essential simile. What's, what's the function of that simile? If, if, that's, if that's an example of a simile, albeit taken from John Milton's work, if that's an example of a simile, what would you extrapolate from that as what a simile is? What's it, what's it trying to achieve? So, within the context of this description, this description, if you've not read Paradise Lost, sorry, assuming prior knowledge, is describing Satan. Okay? And one of the things that Milton does a lot in Book One of Paradise Lost is to, to, to describe this, this figure of Satan, fallen, uh, creating pandemonium, and he rises up and so on. So, trying to describe and, and capture the essence of Satan. What would you say the function of that simile is? Okay, in an effort to do what? Connect with the real world, what we can see. Okay, so to compare something known to something uh, maybe more unfamiliar in order to tease out that similarity. And the ultimate function is to convey the size of Satan. Yeah? So if his shield is the size of the moon, it's, it's almost incomprehensible how big Satan is. Right? Okay, it's almost beyond um, the imagination. And that... That, in a way, is quite often what we use, similes or metaphors, to connect something from the known world to something from the unknown. So if I was to, to think about, right, what's the purpose of simile, I might use a definition of <coughs> comparison between two seemingly different things 
in order to draw or reveal an unexpected likeness to help clarify that. And maybe I might put these tags on that usually they're signposted by those two words. Okay. So that, to me, is an entry-level um, understanding of the concept of a simile. Okay? If I have to move this on, here's a bit more of um, that description of Satan. And what I'm particularly interested in is the bit that I've italicised. So if I give you a minute just to read through that, it's, it's still trying to describe Satan. If you're not really familiar with Paradise Lost, a couple of things would stump you there. You need to know um, that Fessel and Valdano are two places just outside Tuscany. One's a high hilly area and the latter is a valley. Is our definition of a simile, is that robust enough? Or, or has, have I sort of upset that a little bit? Have I disrupted that? I wrote this. <laughs> okay. Can you elaborate that a little bit more? Um, well, I suppose through the optic glass, uh, through the wall, through the, well, it's looked at through human technology or eyes. Okay. Um, so, particular person point of view, personality, possibly. Okay, now I'll come to that, that's a great point. Is the problem that the, the bit about the Tuscan artist doesn't tell us anything about the sign of Satan? Is that just about the moon? So there's, at no point is anyone actually looking for Satan's sheep, it isn't teaching them anything about how an astronomy we're getting, Yeah, that's a good point, but both of those, in fact, we're, we're, we're getting a little bit further away from Satan's shield. Is it that they're seeing the moon through an optic lamp, so actually to them they're seeing it much smaller, which would emphasise that Satan is actually even bigger because the moon seems to be smaller. Okay. The, the trouble perhaps is that the definition was it's something known and something unknown, but here if you don't understand the references, then your known element becomes a bit well, that, that's, a, that's a great point. I'll add that in the next time. I just <laughs> 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 well, I read that, Come back to the Tuscan artist, you're, you're getting ahead of the game, like a class that destroys your carefully <laughs> meticulous activities. <laughs> you're getting to the end. Um, I, I suppose what I had in mind here, and you, you, we can't, we are in the ballpark area, is that this comparison between one thing and another, which was the basis for understanding of the concept of a simile, has now become highly specific. Under a variety of different conditions, it's like that. And isn't it weird to say, not only to introduce the idea of the Tuscan artist and the, and the, and the lens looking through it, but also, it's like looking through that um, optic lens at that time, in the evening on the top of a hill, or in Valdano. So it's not enough thing at all, because clearly you're changing your mind like that, which is good Yeah, or you're introducing a lot of different variables in which it can be like, say, the shield. So, the point I suppose I was trying to extrapolate is that actually similes are mu can be much more complicated than a one-to-one -one relationship. It's actually one plus one, 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 one. There's, there's, there's multiple different variations, there's many clauses on that comparison, making that comparison much more specific and tight. Um, so I wonder if our simile now, we've gone through a bit of a threshold within the concept of simile. So we're now saying there's such a thing as an extended simile. Okay? And that actually you can have multiple points of reference. Each one of those making this, the connection that we're trying to make as specific as possible. Now, I don't think that a year seven student is going to be able to understand that level of complexity. I think you have to introduce first the idea that one thing corresponds to something else, from the known to the unknown. Okay, bear with me. Right. Can I just give you a minute to read and just familiarise yourself with those three passages?
promise I get to actual assessment at some point. I've been doing a lot of background work. Um, this is a different simile from Paradise Lost, but still trying to describe Satan. So this is the point. He stood and called his legions, so he's kind of right in hand when he's beginning to rise, angel forms, who lay in trance that thick as autumnal leaves that strow the brooks in Valambrosa, and so on. I'm particularly interested in the bits that I've italicised and the connection between them. So if we're saying that a simile, first of all, has a one-to-one -one correspondence to something else, and then that a simile can have multiple points of reference in order to make that comparison as tight and specific as possible, is there now a new layer that we can introduce into the concept of a simile? If so, what is it? Is there an extent to which certain similes or metaphors have an existence beyond the specific text in which they find themselves, so they're culturally understood, and therefore, for example, we have three different um, examples from, from kind of Western tradition of writing in which the simile of the thief and the man being have a specific reference, but there's plenty of others like saying, I'm feeling it up today. You know that that means a positive emotion or whatever else. Yeah, ab ab I mean, in a sense, I suppose all language has that wider reference, but ab that's what I'm driving at. That these, Milton is, doesn't write about all tongue and leaves that describe the amount of fallen angels if he's not aware that that's a famous literary illusion. That leaves are often used to describe the fallen dead in classical literature. <coughs> yeah, absolutely. And, and so either we're looking at another layer that talks about intertextuality, or I suppose what I was driving at, I think both these things are true, is that the simile ostensibly has a function to tell you about the size of Satan, but it also has a function as an aesthetic object of itself. Yeah? So on the one hand it has a narrative or function, but on the other it has an artistic function that sits beyond that. So I wonder now if we can introduce a third layer. The secondary object or vehicle can be elaborated into an independent aesthetic object which for the moment excludes the primary object. In a way, Milton's trying to draw the comparison between the figures from the Enid and the Iliad more than he is to the, to the moon, which seemed to be the original point of producing that symbol. So I think we've gone through another threshold. I hope that you do too, but so when Ray this morning was talking about um, the idea of gender studies, I think I think there's so many stages going through before you grasp the totality of what's meant by gender studies. And I'm, I'm trying to illustrate that through the example of a similar. Yes. Or a bit critically, he's making a link between himself and, and the writers. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. He's, which is what he's trying to do. You know, you know, if you know much about Paradise, that's actually what Milton's trying to do. Right from the beginning, he's trying to position himself almost before um, some of the <coughs> primary classical poets, or even um, Moses as the kind of the first um, poet within the Christian Judaism culture and so on. One final point. I want to come back to this. And I want to come back to <coughs> the Tuscan artist. Does anyone know who that is? Nelson's right on the early 1700s. No. Think of the link of the telescope. Galileo. Okay? And without going into <coughs> an alternative a literature lesson, <laughs> uh, would be nice. Um, I probably need to prepare a little bit more than off the hoof. Paris lost that talk about six or seven years ago. But anyway, um, the, the point is, and this is, uh, this is something I studied at university, this is what's called in Milton's study an observer simile. So you kind of alluded to that, I think, two or three, the gentleman only alluded to this. Galileo actually sits inside this simile as making some kind of judgment on Satan. So actually, it's not so much the comparison between the moon, it's the fact of the fact that comparison has been filtered through the consciousness of Galileo looking through his optical lens up at the moon. And Galileo being kind of quite a revolutionary figure, challenging orthodoxy at the time and then kind of getting uh, banned and under house arrest because of that. Um, so I think we've got a fourth layer level there. But actually, Semi's got nothing to do with necessarily making the comparisons of physical size, but they actually allow you to make a moral judgment. So, again, depending on your, how much you know about Paradise Lost, but what, you, what ostensibly people find when they read Paradise Lost, particularly Book One, is what an incredibly alluring figure that Satan is. 
He's much more arresting than, than, than God in that, in that book. And, but if you dig beneath the surface, what you begin to find is actually Milton using things like the epic simile in order to challenge the way that that, that kind of e evil and cruelty can be alluring, but actually what lies behind them. Some of the observer similes, there's three or four of them in book one, where there's some kind of character <coughs> that passes a moral judgment on Satan. Well, I'll put that aside for a moment because I realise that's quite heavy. Um, but the point being, I think we've gone through a process of something like that. So I've taken one English concept, the metaphor of the simile, and I'm suggesting that I don't think anyone could understand that without understanding some of the steps beneath that. And here is that liminality. So, once I started to read about threshold concepts a few years ago now, and started to think, actually, that makes a great deal of sense, not only from a student learning point of view, but my own, that took me quite a while to think that through. I know it just looks like a couple of slides, but the thinking behind that took me a long time to think of that kind of example and to apply it to one specific concept in English, the idea of metaphor. And it's really helped me to understand my own subject knowledge, and therefore how I'm going to teach. Now, in an ideal world, if I was to start now on a key stage three assessment, I might include um, metaphor as an overt concept that we return to. Uh, that's probably what I would have done. But the reality is that in a school, I've got lots of other roles, I'm not really working just on assessment. So you, you start with a model, and you know it's not the best that you want it to be, but you have to refine it over time because you have all sorts of different competing demands. So, there are some other principles underpinning what I'm about to sort of share with you. Um, and really, they are around the belief that actually breaking down learning and, and sequencing that. I know some of the sessions earlier, Joe's session, for example, was alluded to like, really important summers. You know, what, what is it you want to, to, to teach your students? What sequence is that going to go in? Um, and that makes all sorts of powerful connections because in a student's mind, you want to try and build up a schema. Something where they can learn a new text and, and slot into some kind of wider meaning. Mastery, which is a term that gets banged around quite a lot to mean lots of different things, but in my understanding it means that you largely understand one concept and one idea and kind of don't really move on until you, you kind of grasp that or certainly most of that. I think that assessment should help to inform the next steps and that, again, going back to my, one of the first points I made, that any inferences, and I'm aware that assessment just gives you inferences, not, not absolute truth, but any inferences that assessment gives you, there has to be a mechanism that allows you to actually do something about it. So particularly, you know, talking about how you intervene in Key Stage 3, um, it's no good just knowing those kids are falling behind when you want them to be. What are you going to actually do to, to do something about it? Um, I'll come back to the idea of expectations in a minute. I've increasingly come around to the idea of making comparative judgments about extended writing, um, rather than referring to Mark's scheme, but that's probably a different presentation. Probably have people better equipped to do that than me. Um, I think if you're going to assess that you need multiple modes of, um, of doing that, so for example, multiple choice, an essay, short answer questions, to try and build a more holistic understanding of the reliability of the inferences that you can draw. And that, as I've kind of hinted, if you, anything like me at my school, isn't it funny how much you realise not many people have that much high level expertise of assessment? You know, I was a few, the head of English driving through you know, the whole school assessment because I happen to know the most about it because I've talked a different way after reading about threshold concepts. I've, I've not been schooled on assessment, but I've had to learn a lot. And it's just there's a dearth, I think, um, in teacher training at that level, in my opinion. Anyway, I okay. Right, I have blogged about this before. Um, so, I come up with the idea of the elements of language, and the elements being a sort of metaphor for what are the, what's the roadmap that you can take within your, within your subject. And these are, I suppose, overarching short distilled summaries about what it is that comprises each of these different thresholds. So for us, in writing, we're looking at academic voice, language and style, the way the text were organised, and then accuracy and control. And then we've got some equivalent ones for reading, 
Um, and again, I think if I thought about it differently, I might combine the two, maybe as metaphor, syntax, that kind of thing. Last year, um, I sort of came, because I was trying to really interest in the idea of mastery, came up with these sort of labels. These are basically destroyed. Um, <laughs> came up with these labels to, I suppose, have some way of signposting what it actually meant to progress through a different threshold. One of the flaws of this is if there might be four, there might be three. There might be, you need to have as many thresholds as the concept warrants, but there's also a, a constraint, a practical constraint that you have in place in those stores. So that's why it exists as it does. I was trying to get somewhere signpost signposts in the fact that this here is what I would think around key stage two, what we expect students to be able to do, know, and have mastery over. And to signpost this as being, if, if they can't do these things, it's unacceptable, and we need to do something about it, right, from a whole school perspective and relentlessly. Now, I'm aware of some of the arguments around some of my terminology, but what it was really trying to get at was the idea of mastery. I wasn't trying to think about gender politics and so on, but I am aware of those arguments. I was also aware, particularly outside of my curriculum area, when we started to apply these concepts and other subjects, that we were in danger of um, creating something around levels, but under a different name. And it wasn't really until a little bit of reading and thinking that by transferring these to the idea of expectations, you've got a completely different kettle of fish. And again, there are some problems with this, but for me, this is a huge step forward. Huge step. Because what we're essentially saying as a school, um, taking this far, for example, is that these are what our students are expected to know and be able to do in the key stage two. We have some debate about individual items and the way that I phrase them, I accept that, but <coughs> I try to make this line up with where the, the standard would be at the end of key stage two. If you can't do that, we need to go to do something about it immediately and to kind of divert a lot of resources to make sure that you can. Not let that kind of fester for several years and then try and put all sorts of productive intervention near towards the exams. So what we're effectively saying is that by the end of year seven, we want students to be able to do these things and we expect it to happen. And I think that changes the, um, the conversation completely across the school. Um, so broadly, I'm just, just dealing with sort of old money at the moment. If you're sort of being around whatever level three is and then it's a new equivalent. Level four and level five. So for the vast majority of our students, these would be what we what our expectations are. If we genuinely felt, and I'll talk about how we might go about doing that shortly, if we genuinely felt that the students could do this stuff, and we felt that was a reliable inference, then we might look at these as being their expectations. I don't think that would be that many kids. I think more in maths than English, if I'm honest. But if we genuinely felt they could actually do these things, and properly and fully, then that might be their expectations. So, if I take out the year seven expectations, which for the moment are the critical mass, the vast majority of our students this is what we expect them to be able to engage with in the year. You need to make that a little bit more tangible. So we've taken this overarching sort of state of intent and turned that into more, something more quantifiable. So assessment objectives. Not too many that it becomes overwhelming, um, and not too few that it's just it's, it's meaningless. And this then becomes the objectives that are going to underpin the way that we structure our lessons, our teaching. So, if we now have the objectives, we can assess them at the end of the year, distilled through a range of different assessment vehicles. So one of them might be an extended response or two, multiple choice, and short answer. And so what I would see is that you have these assessment objectives appearing more than once across a variety of different assessment vehicles. 
And you're not just having one point of contact going several areas where that expectation, and I, you definitely have to you know, set the standard of your expectation in the question, and I think you also have to have a very clear idea about what we mean by this being a, a, a piece of writing at that standard. And crucially, that everyone in the park understands that as well, which is where I think comparative judgment can come into play, and I'll mention that right at the end. Okay, so that's about progress. And I would see us only doing that at the beginning and the end of the year, um, because that's where I think that's a decent stretch of, of learning, and I think actually there will be some change over that. You would have reached those expectations. So, if we look at a notion of trauma, kids come in, um, they will have a baseline in English and maths. And it will be in line with our expectations for where they should be. And what that allows us to do, if we get it right, I don't think we got it fully right last year, but we modified it and improved it this year, is that we can triangulate that with other measures that we have. So, you know, we can basically probe that. Sometimes the kids come from PSH2, sometimes they don't have what I think they have, other times they do. This would be a good way of cross-referencing those, so we can be reliably sure where kids are. Are they genuinely needing much more support, or are they genuinely exceeding what we think they can at that stage? And as a consequence of that, we can then apply them to the relevant set of expectations. And then that's what they pursue. We, we set in three bands. Um, we probably really only have a, a sort of top set, middle two groups of a mix, and then we have a much smaller, lower group. Um, and then in the year. However, and then at that stage, we might talk about that briefly, hopefully, they move to the higher set of standards. I would like to build in, we are going to build in, another assessment around about springtime, maybe even earlier than that. And this is where those students that we've identified um, as being below expectation. If you're teaching set four, which is probably the only place I'd expect to see those students, if I'm honest, your job is to meet them up to that expectation. And then we would assess that again sort of at about sort of halfway point of the year. And really, by then, they should have reached expectation. And if they haven't, well, we've still got a bit more time there to close the gap. So what I, what I think this does is signal very powerfully to our school, our teachers, that actually we're going to invest our time, our resources, and our commitment lower down the school, and to raise the, expect, the expectation of what we think our students can do, and to have a reliable curriculum and assessment vehicle that can make that happen. One of the things... The two arguments that some, and I do get them both, that um, colleagues across the school have, have suggested, and I use that as a colleagues in these parts, but one of them is, well, some kids are never going to get there. You know, and I, I know where they're coming from, but if you give too much credence to that argument, then there's no kind of stopping to it in a way. And so if we think about all the students in our school, that I think would really struggle to meet those expectations. I think there's a lesser amount of those that have genuine difficulties that make it almost impossible no matter how much time and effort you have. I think there are others that are way behind for maybe reasons of absence, poor teaching, family circumstance, whatever it happens to be. And I think those, we have to, we have, to have something that says, this is unacceptable, we need to do something about it. Okay. I realise some of you might not feel that way, that's, that's my personal feeling. The other thing that people have said is, well, what happens if you give kids are above expectation? And I thought about that. Well, then we're going back to, if I we go back to something like this, and then we're having beyond expectation. Beyond, beyond expectation, and we're going back to exactly the same problem of levels. But I did kind of know what they mean. If you've got kids that can genuinely meet these expectations, what do you have beyond them? Until this sort of um, dilemma was squared for me by Lucy Cream, I'm definitely familiar with her, but certainly there, who's carried out some, some, some international research, um, looking at different jurisdictions. She's in the process of writing a book which has been crowdsourced funding. Uh, so I'm very excited. And she did this presentation on other jurisdictions around the world and, and how they 
how they use assessment, and what lessons can we learn and, and apply, and which ones should we reject, and what are some of the dangers. And I asked her, because she spoke, I think, about, I think it was, it was like, it might have been Korea, where, they, where they've got an expectations driven culture that wants some core action. And I said, well, what happens for those kids beyond expectations? What happens there? Are there a de different set of expectations? And she said, they do nothing. They do nothing. Because what they're trying to do is to raise everyone up to a minimum expectation. And actually, having a separate set of assessment criteria above that makes no difference to those kids. They are still better at English, better at maths, better at whatever. And I thought, yeah, I think you're right. I really think you're right. It's a little bit like um, I teach a teacher and a couple of other people who have had some phenomenal students who pretty much got four marks every time on an essay. I don't need a band half to sit at top band one to be able to extend those kids. I don't actually need something writ large. I just teach them harder content, more content, at a deeper level. I don't need it to be enshrined within an assessment model. What I do need to be enshrined in an assessment model is a minimum expectation for all my students that drives that, that progress. So, um, the other side of this, I think, because I'm very mindful about creating a system where you have lots of different areas of assessment that are that teachers are trying to focus on all those things at once and got this massive spreadsheet and it looks awful. And I also think there's a lot to be said for teachers have autonomy over their own classes and to be able, you know, no kids are the same. You know, you've got students in one class, they are going to have, they might still need the same expectations, but they might need it in a different order. And so there's got to be some mechanism in my mind where the teacher is professionally responsible for working out how to get towards those objectives. So if you take these being the year seven objectives, these might have been notionally mapped out against our three units in year seven. The Odyssey, Shakespeare and Science. Uh, Shakespeare and Play, and so on, etc. So these are where we're going to hit some of these objectives, etc, etc. So you as a teacher, your job is these objectives over a 12-week 12 12 period. And we return to some of the interleague, but broadly, that's what I think it looks like. We then have this, which we've done a lot of work in the last 18 months to develop. It's not, it's not a checklist, you don't have to do this, but we're trying to get at the idea, and I, I know David Dido has done a lot of work on this, as, as teaching as a sequence. So we've really tried to do a lot of work to destroy the idea that you're just learning lessons, and obviously you're learning lessons, but the lesson is the unit of, of learning. And lots of people have written some fantastic stuff on that. So we're trying to see learning within uh, a, unit, a longer unit of time that allows you to encompass various different concepts and to actually more deeply learn that rather than just performing one lesson to the next. So, say for example, we have a, a two-week cycle in my school and we have about seven, seven English lessons in year seven. What this does, I suppose, is say, well, what are the one or two objectives that we want in that cycle? What's the other things that those kids need that sit outside of that? So it might be some knowledge, it might be um, something that they, you've, not, no, you've noticed that they can't do. And you as a teacher, being a good teacher, I try to meet the needs of your kids. So you plug in your objectives here, and this is what you're planning. You then are trying to work out how that marries up to their prior knowledge, their prior learning. And then you go through this sequence of learning where I suppose it's looking at directly explaining something, modelling it, deconstructing it, dealing with the misconceptions, questioning, you know, short, you know, low stakes assessment, consolidating. And then, towards the end of that cycle, the kids are flying it. And then at the end of that, you are notionally looking to what extent these students have understood, through too strong a word probably, but for want of a better expression, understood those objectives albeit that's always contingent on time. So, I see this kind of Bill and William style um, uh, teacher, uh, rough uh, spreadsheet that maps that short-term performance. And so you've got the longer-term goals of the objective that take place across the year, but they are, at the level of the teacher, being broken down into actual to-be-learned items. Now, it doesn't mean that you agree you've absolutely mastered that, but you performed it to suggest that you've got a decent understanding over a two-week period, for example. And then you can return to that later. 
These aren't centralised, these are generated at the level of the teacher. But those aren't the kids in my school, by the way. Actually, I got a weird. <laughs> so the future, what next? Well, one of the things I would like to do, and I was talking to someone earlier about how you might go about doing this, is to have a separate assessment around the knowledge component, and to have that at the beginning um, of the year. And I think all subjects do something like this, and then at the end, so a kind of core knowledge element to the curriculum. Um, The second sort of innovation that I'd like to, um, to make is hard in a big school, um, is to think about, if that's a year seven standard, we need to be very clear in relation to student work about what that means. So we need to, need to have a, a, you know, one or two, maybe more clear pieces of work that exemplify that standard. And then comparative judgment works on the premise that is the work that you have from the student as good or not? and there's pieces of software that you can use that, 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 that track that. And so, what I'm suggesting is, if you have all those essays, you might have some tolerance. So, I don't know what that is. And in a way, in these initial years, we're beginning to figure that out. I don't think you have to 100% master all those concepts. True mastering usually works on the premise of about 80%. I think if you were on about 80% mastering all those objectives that I'm suggesting, you would probably have a decent enough grasp to be able to move on to the higher set of standards. Below that, probably not. So, which is why I'd probably include all these essays in meeting the expectation, but clearly these two are way below. Which probably raises the question, what do you do then? Well, what you do then is you have um, those objectives that those kids have not managed to meet, have some understanding about what they are, and then you can plot those in to the beginning of the next year and start to address that and to reassess talking about something that's probably a year away in actual practice. Um, I know that's an area of development, that's just my initial thought about what that might look like. So all the time, ident having a clear set of what we want our students to be able to sit, you know, know, do and experience, having some mechanism that tests that as valid as we possibly can by making multiple points of inference over a long enough time for that genuine to stuff, and then having mechanisms to actually do something in relation to what happens when there's underachievement. And I, I'm convinced that would be better than everything we've ever done before. And it certainly moves the conversation away from just year 11 interventions. Um, so really, it's about that kind of portal, about that kind of threshold. And for me, the assessment vehicle that we've developed, which is not perfect, so from the outset, I think it will allow students, the vast majority of students, to go through those different points of expectation those different thresholds and, and to make the kind of progress that we want them to do. So that by the time they get to PSH4, they can really have significantly more knowledge and understanding and we can rein in some of our current practices. Um, anyway, that's, that's the plan and hopefully that was useful. Um, thank you. Yes, that's on my blog, I just thought. I, yeah. is that it is. I, funny enough, I wrote about Satan at uh, the Paradise Lost a number of months ago. It's my least popular post ever. <laughs> I, did, I did call it Satan, Paradise Lost, Transformational Knowledge, and something like that. Okay. So I probably need to put top 10 tips for assessment, and I've got a huge amount of tips. It's, my, it's kind of don't ask me why it's Joey Bagstock, WordPress. He was a character in, uh, not, I think it was Dombey and Son. And I thought it sounded funny. <laughs> I've lived to regret it since. <laughs> Joey Bagstock is my blog address, and that's my Twitter handle as well. I'm at school with a very thin sense of the year. So it's Cold as ice, that's yeah. great. 
Um, or you can have an epic symbol from Paradise Lost, and they're different things. Yeah. So checking that neatly off yeah. is not done and dusted. Yeah. But, and I don't think, it, I, I think it's overwhelming to have something that's, that runs to hundreds of items that you, that you check off. And also, put bluntly, if I'm a little honest, I, I, I feel a little bit reductive running that from year seven through to year 11. Um, we've got, I feel like I've got a unique opportunity to do something different at Key Stage 3. And just to work backwards on the exam at year 11 might not be the best. But they're great, they give you a they give you a yeah, decent no, no, start. Really right. I think they are the two kind of like properly and I don't know if it's something to remain from the Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. Hey, um, if all your lessons are taught in sets. Yeah. We've moved to mixed abilities, I'm just sort of wondering how you can adapt that model to yeah, I don't know, I've not given it enough thought. I mean, there's always an element of mixability in whatever group you have. Yeah. I've, got, I've oscillated on my views on setting over the years, and just changing a group doesn't make any difference unless you do something different. Yeah. But for me, having taught groups where you've got such a variance of kids that you know, can't write against some, some high flyers that know more about sonnets in year seven than I do, I think it does need to be the creation of a different environment in which you can do different things with those kids, as long as you actually do different things. So, but I, I don't know how to adapt some of that in more of a mixed ability environment, other than if you're making that expectation of everybody, then yeah. that is the expectation of everybody, yeah. um, I suppose. But that so is, in a way... create different checklists for different groups of students? Potentially, like, although you, if you're saying this is a minimum expectation, that message needs to be written large across yeah. your class or your group, your department, in my opinion. Any others? Uh, two more last two, yeah. Um, I was wondering, <coughs> you said you do a baseline at the beginning and then you, you sort of check for Do you have to, does that match with the school's reporting sort of structure? Is, is, <coughs> are you only sort yeah, of we are looking at, we are looking at parents? And when, when we report and why, yeah. and we've had that situation where you've had a report and then a parent sitting the next week, or, you know, that, which is odd. Um, so we are looking at the, at the points of the year in which we do. Um, marry those things up and so yeah that's part of the conversation but one of the things you kind of have to be committed to the calendar sometimes before yeah. you can change it. But yes, absolutely it does need to match up to those critical points. Uh, last one.